Hello, my name is Dr. Funda Goldman. I'm a licensed naturopathic physician with a private practice in Stratford, Connecticut. Today I want to discuss um, different teas that someone can take if they're experiencing stress, nervousness, um, and or insomnia. So let's take a look. Before we get too far along, uh, just a word of caution. The information presented here is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. For individual medical advice or if symptoms are severe or worsening, please seek a qualified healthcare professional. It's also important to understand that anxiety, nervousness, insomnia um, can be multi-causal um, and can be a complex issue. So the information presented here is really just for mild to moderate insomnia as part of a complete wellness um, or health program. So to start with, um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today um, need a little bit of background. So um, let's just discuss Ayurveda and the concept of vata. So Ayurveda, if you're not familiar um, with it, it's also known as traditional Indian medicine. It's over 5,000 years old. And this is a different paradigm of medicine than the Western model that um, most people are familiar with today. Um, in this paradigm, uh, very simply but profoundly, people and diseases are categorized as being primarily of three types. One is wind, too much wind or vata. Two is too much fire or pitta. And three is too much earth or kapha. So stress, nervousness and, nervousness, and insomnia, they're actually all considered to be vata or high wind uh, conditions. And so if we think about wind a little bit, um, you can kind of look at the picture here. This is a nice picture of fall where everything is sort of dry and, and um, airy, uh, the leaves have fallen off the tree. Um, you know, when you think of wind, uh, what are the qualities of it just intuitively? right? Um, the qualities of wind are cold, it's dry, right? Mobile, it's always moving, it's rough, it kind of comes and goes, it's light, it's clear, you can't actually see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind, like if the leaves are um, kind of shaking on a tree. So in Ayurveda, very simply, if somebody has a high vata or high wind condition, you want to introduce opposite qualities to the qualities of wind. So if wind is cold, dry, mobile, rough, light, and clear, you want to introduce qualities of warm, liquid, soft, static, um, smooth, heavy, and opaque. And so, especially with warm liquid, <laughs> um, that lends itself to tea pretty well. Uh, just a word about making tea, um, there are general, Here's just a general outline of ways to make tea um, that you, you might consider. So most herbs require about half of a teaspoon to one full teaspoon per cup for brewing. And most herbal preparations can be taken um, for one to two cups a day and exceptions have been noted um, in the presentation. So one, uh, one of the main methods for making tea is called the infusion method. In this method, water is boiled and then poured over an herb. Um, so typically the herb steeps in the water for five to eight minutes before straining and steeping longer, um, you might be a little bit careful, can result in a bitter flavor, but you wanna cover the pot to make sure that you retain the essential oils from the plant. And this is the main method used for the softer, more delicate parts of the plant, such as flower petals and leaves the delicate leaves. Not all leaves are delicate, but delicate leaves. A second method is decoction. So this is a little bit more intense. And this is where you actually have the herb actively boiled in, in water, sometimes milk, some sort of liquid, typically for 10 to 20 minutes. So the herb is actively boiled rather than just pour a little warm water on it. Um, and it's usually cooked, you know, actively cooked for a longer amount of time. The pot is covered to prevent liquid from concentrating too much as well as um, preventing essential oils from escaping. Um, and this is the main method used for the tougher parts of plants like bark and stems and seeds and roots and fruits because you need a little bit more heat and time to break down the harder part of the plant to elicit the medicinal properties. There's also the sun tea method. This is where you can place an herb in water and leave it in the sun for several hours. Typically two to four hours is sufficient to make a tea. 
And this again can be used for the softer parts of plants such as petals and soft leaves. And there's also um, moon tea uh, that you can make. So uh, this is where herb is placed in water and left in moonlight for several hours, typically two to four hours, although it can be overnight. And then um, again, this is also using the softer parts of plants like petals and soft leaves. So from um, an energetic point of view, if you make a sun tea, the tea will uh, be infused with the qualities of the sun, so it's going to be more active and warming. Um, if you do a moon tea, um, that's going to be more kind of um, gentle and cooling. So um, again, different ways to make tea. So the first herb is ajwan, or I've also heard it ajwain. Um, this is basically the um, seeds from wild celery. Um, and typically the seeds are used and it's an infusion methods that used here. Um, ajwan is a really important herb for any kind of vata condition in Ayurveda. Um, and here you can see that it's not just good for the nervous system, but for many different things. So for the nervous system, it is a little bit of a stimulant. So if you're feeling fatigued, it can be helpful there, but it's also an antispasmodic and helps with pain and tension. For the respiratory system, it's a decongestant. It can help with colds, cough, flu, bronchitis, asthma, and laryngitis because it is a warming herb. Um, it is considered heart tonic. It can actually help to uh, with the GI, so it can help normalize digestion. It can help with colic and gas. It's some mild laxatives. It can help with intestinal spasms. And for the GU, um, it can actually help with urinary frequency and pain from uh, like kidney stones, for example. It does have a little bit of antiseptic property, mostly for worms and fungal infections. And for women, it can help with lactation as well as menstrual pain. So you can kind of see that, you know, even though it's relaxing, you know, it's, it's uh, for the nervous system, um, you can see that overall it's, it's relaxing for most tissues in the body. And so again, it's helpful for people experiencing stress or um, anxiety, insomnia. Um, the seeds um, are also detoxifying and they can help with edema, so if you have some swelling. And it's actually um, helpful for digesting wheat. Um, uh, from a spiritual point of view, it helps to balance the fist chakra or the throat chakra. Contraindication, so if somebody has high pitta or high fire, like something like uh, gastric reflux, acidity, um, or they're pregnant, um, this is not a great herb to use. A second herb um, that you might consider, that you might have in your kitchen already, or it's easy to find at the grocery store, is cardamom. Cardamom, again, for the nervous system is an antispasmodic. It's really great for the respiratory system, like colds, coughs, bronchitis, asthma, hoarseness. It's warming, not as warm as ajwan, um, but it's still very helpful for stimulating, um, regulating uh, function for the lungs. Um, it's helpful in the cardiovascular system for um, toning up hemorrhoids. For the GI, it's also important for indigestion, nausea, vomiting. So you can see it's actually sort of for somebody who has um, uh, heat in the stomachs, so it's actually balancing for that um, belching, acid regurgitation, gas. It's a gentle liver and bile stimulant. Um, for the GU system, it's diuretic and it can help for any urination. Um, actually, for women, uh, if you're experiencing morning sickness, this can be a nice herb to, again, um, balance the nausea feeling that you might be experiencing. And spiritually, this um, herb is really great for balancing the fourth chakra or the heart chakra. Um, it tends to st stimulate or clarify the mind and the heart. It also is um, sort of practically uh, useful practically because it uh, neutralizes the mucus forming properties of milk and have, helps to antidote to some extent caffeine and coffee. So um, that may be part of the reason why in some parts of the world like the Mideast, Middle East, cardamom is added to coffee to kind of neutralize some of the harsher effects of coffee. It can also generally be used for sexual debility um, for men and women. It can help with bleeding. It's a really nice flavoring and it can also help to digest bananas if that's an issue. So again, another herb that's gentler warming, but gentler than ajwan um, that can help with nervousness and anxiety and kind of help 
relax the mind and body a bit um, to get to sleep. The third herb, most people probably have this in their kitchen, cinnamon. Cinnamon on a nervous system level, um, it does help m with mild pain and release tension. Again, it's really great for the respiratory system, cold, cough, congestion, bronchitis can be helped with cinnamon. For the cardiovascular system, it helps with cold extremities um, and improves circulation. It's also considered a heart tonic. Uh, so if you have cold hands and feet, it can be helpful there. The GI system, um, it, again, indigestion, diarrhea, and it increases appetite. So if you're a little bit low in appetite, it can be helpful there. It, it also uh, is helpful with frequent urination. It can be helpful with mild forms of arthritis um, because, again, it helps stimulate the cardiovascular system circulation, and it's a mild analgesic. Um, for the immune system, it's antibacterial and antifungal. Uh, for men, it can actually increase the quantity of semen and can help with impotence. And for women, it can help with painful absent or excessive menses, ovarian cysts, fibroids, and endometriosis. Actually, cinnamon was a major herb used by midwives back in the day um, to help with bleeding postpartum. Um, yeah. So it also has a lot of bioflavonoids nutritionally, and it's really great for helping with diabetes, uh, again, bleeding in general, not just for women. It's a gentle detoxifier. It's a great flavoring. Uh, most people like it. Um, it has similar properties to ginger, but it's not as aggravating to pitta, so people who have fiery or conditions or a lot of inflammation, and it helps to digest black tea. Um, just uh, be careful if you're pregnant, you just want to use small doses there. But again, cinnamon is a very gentle herb. Um, it's a warming herb that again is going to balance the qualities of a vata condition, such as anxiety, nervousness, and insomnia. Fennel is another herb uh, that's very helpful. Again, if we look at the nervous system, it it's, has a calming effect, it's antispasmodic, and it helps with photosensitivity if that's an issue, like if you have lupus, for example. Um, the respiratory system has helped with it. Um, coughs, asthma, it's a decongestant, it helps with colds. It also helps with toning up hemorrhoids in the cardiovascular system. It also is helpful with indigestion, intestinal spasm, nausea, colic, so especially if you have a uh, um, acidic stomach or inflammation in the gut. This is a really nice herb. Um, it's a little bit more cooling. Um, so if there's a spectrum, Ajwan is the hottest that we've talked about so far. Then cinnamon and cardamom are warming. Fennel is uh, considered neutral to a little bit cooling. This can also be helpful if you have what's considered low Agni in Ayurveda. So Agni is sort of a digestive fire. So if you're not digesting food well or if you don't have much of an appetite, um, uh, excuse me, if you're not that, um, it actually helps to curb appetite, but if you're not digesting food very well, if it's just sort of sitting in your stomach and, and not kind of moving along, um, well, then fennel can help with that. It also helps with cramps and gas, um, diarrhea, and it gently stimulates the liver. In the GU system, um, it's a diuretic, so it can kind of clean out the kidneys a bit. It helps with cystitis and burning urination. So even if there's burning in the urinary tract system, it can be helpful there. It relaxes muscles a bit. Um, it can help with worms um, if you have an infection. For women, it's, it may be well known mostly for lactation, but it can help with menstrual cramps and morning sickness as well. Um, and spiritually, it helps to increase clarity of consciousness. Um, generally, it's a detoxifying herb. It can help with edema or swelling. And again, it's a nice flavoring herb. So the herbs that I've talked about so far are all kitchen spices. And, um, you know, because they're used in cooking, they tend to be nice flavoring herbs and easy to take as, you know, a daily dose of uh, herbal medicine. Holy basil, or also known as Tulsi, um, is a great herb. It is in the basil family. It's a specific um, species within the basil family. Um, for the nervous system, it's it's actually really great with insomnia. Um, I often give it to people who have actually recently lost somebody, um, if there's been a death um, um, in the family or a loved one, um, and people are having a hard time sleeping. I, I tend to use holy basil quite a bit. It's an antispasmodic, it's a calming herb, it can help with some types of headaches, um, uh, helps with stress, anxiety, and it can help with depression. Again, we're talking about mild to moderate 
um, symptoms here. Nothing too extreme, and again, it's part of a whole program. It also helps with the rest. It's really great for the lungs. So it's, it's in the respiratory system. It can help with cough, cold, sinus congestion, bronchitis, allergies, and flu. Because this is a warming herb, it tends to help with, you know, more the congestive type of um, colds and flus rather than the really kind of hot, dry ones. Um, it helps with the cardiovascular system. It's a diaphoretic, so it's going to move the blood supply to the top layer of the skin, and you might sweat a little bit when you first drink it, um, but then you'll cool down. It actually helps to lower cholesterol and increase the circulation as well, somewhat like uh, cinnamon. It also is very helpful for the GI, so you can see how these herbs um, can be very helpful on multi levels. And so, as you're kind of looking at the list, you might look at like which whole profile of an herb most fits your own situation. Um, it helps with indigestion, it can increase appetite, it can help with ulcerative colitis and ulcers in general um, because, again, it's a healing herb. Um, mild forms of arthritis can be helped here. Um, fungal infections, it is an anti-inflammatory. Um, and this balances the sixth chakra or the third eye. So it helps with uh, intuition and uh, so spiritual spiritual sight, spiritual vision. Um, it increases devotion in somebody, um, promotes clarity of mind and heart, and also supports meditation because it does not only calm the body, but it calms the mind. It helps to reduce fever, and it's an antioxidant. So many uh, wonderful properties with holy basil or tulsi. Lemon balm, um, also known as Melissa, there are two different names, it's the same herb. Um, it's in the mint family, so, um, uh, but it's really great actually for the nervous system. So it's a mild sedative, it's antispasmodic, it helps with some types of headaches, nervousness, and insomnia. Um, I've given this to various people when they had even musculoskeletal pain, um, or again, they need help with sleeping. Um, and it's great for the cardiovascular system. Again, it's a diaphoretic, so it's going to help to bring the circulation to the top level, um, top layer of the skin. Um, it's good for a nervous heart. It just, again, tends to kind of slow people down when they're feeling a bit racy inside. It's great for nervous indigestion, gas and bloating. Um, it's actually, uh, it's a very gentle herb. It tastes great. It tastes lemony. Um, that's part of why it gets its name. But it's actually gentle enough. Uh, if you make a tea, you can give a few teaspoons to children and it helps with the pain of teething. Um, it also has antiviral properties. It's been used for helping herpes, lesions, colds, and flus. Uh, for women, it can be helpful for PMS mood swings as well as uh, PMS pain. And it's generally because it's a cooling herb can help with fever and chills. So again, a really great herb to, especially like I, I tend to use this when somebody's sort of fluish, but they're also having trouble sleeping and they might be a little bit achy. That's a really great time to use this type of herb. Nutmeg. Okay, so nutmeg, um, uh, nutmeg is actually a fairly potent um, herb. So you can see at the bottom here that you only want to use about an eighth of a teaspoon per cup as you know, in contrast to most of the other herbs using a half teaspoon to a teaspoon per cup. But it's really great for pain, insomnia, especially when you pair it with warm milk, um, if you kind of do that for sleeping, specifically uh, cow's milk, because cow's milk has tryptophan in it, and tryptophan is a kind of a mild, um, soothing neurotransmitter. Um, for somebody who lacks concentration, so their mind is, you know, kind of running restless, if they have restless leg syndrome, so it actually not only, you know, calms down the mind, but it calms down the body, and it relaxes muscles. And again, you don't need much, so if you're doing this herb, you know, for like sleep, for example, or even during the day, you only need really like a little pinch, it's pretty potent. Um, but you only want to use it for short periods of time, so you don't want to do it on a daily basis endlessly, um, because if you do that, it's going to actually dull the mind too much. But if you use it on occasion or for just, you know, for a couple weeks or something like that, that would be all right. But you don't want to get into a long-term daily habit with that leg. It's also great for the respiratory system as a decongestion and helps with coughs. Uh, it's considered a heart tonic, 
It helps us stimulate appetite. It helps with intestinal spasms, diarrhea, gas, bloating, general indigestion, nausea. So from for GI to lower GI. It helps with arthritis, uh, mild forms of it because it's a wor warming herb. It helps with worm infections or parasite infections. Uh, for men, it helps with premature ejaculation. Um, it's considered an aphrodisiac and it can help with prostate disease. Um, and for women, it can help with um, uh, menses that's kind of irregular and been disrupted. Um, this herb is helpful for balancing the seventh chakra or the crown chakra. It supports meditation, um, especially when you're feeling anxious. Um, like if you have a meditation practice and you're feeling anxious and it kind of is uncomfortable just to sit <laughs> because your mind is racing and your body's kind of jumping inside, um, this can be helpful. But again, overuse can dull the mind, especially over the long term. Only use a pinch, you know, an eighth of a teaspoon per cup for a short period of time. And this can actually, um, somewhat like uh, cardamom, help to antidote some of the effects of coffee. Passion flower. Um, this is also a really great herb for sleep. Um, so in the nervous system, it helps with insomnia. It's calming. It helps with anxiety, nervousness, uh, pain. It's antispasmodic. It can help with teething, um, eye infections, and some types of headaches. It's great for bron bronchial asthma because, again, it has that calming effect. So it can... Um, calm down the smooth muscles so the alveoli open up again so you can get a full breath. Um, it helps with high blood pressure because again it's calming. Again depending on what's causing the high blood pressure but if part of the high blood pressure is due to like anxiety this can be somewhat helpful. Um, it's also a diuretic and it's helpful for urinary tract infections. It can help with boils um, on the skin. It's an antiseptic. It can also help with worms. And it can help with menstrual cramps. Um, and again, this is another herb because it is, it helps to just sort of calm the nervous system a bit. It can help with um, meditation when you're feeling anxious. So uh, passion flower is another great herb to consider. Thyme, you might also have this in your kitchen. Um, thyme is more of a heating herb. Um, uh, it's calming, um, it's antispasmodic, it's diaphoretic, and increases circulation uh, because, again, because of the warmth, it tends to kind of stimulate um, blood flow, even though it's common for the nervous system. It's helpful for colds, flus, cough, bronchitis, asthma, it's a lot of lung stuff, bronchial spasms, congestion, sore throat, laryngitis. It's a little bit of an antiseptic. Um, and the GI, indigestion, gas, diarrhea, and intestinal spasms. It can help with wounds um, because of the bioflavonoids in it. It's an, I mentioned it's antiseptic, so it's also good for fungal infections. For women, because of the heat, it can actually bring on menses if it's delayed or irregular. And nutritionally, actually, thyme has uh, copper, man manganese, and bioflavonoids that can boost your internal levels. And it's generally a cleansing herb. Um, you want to be cautious, though, in using this for pregnancy because it's a little bit more strong in its functions. Um, so, again, careful in pregnancy, but small amounts should be okay. So there you go. So a bunch of different herbs uh, you can consider, many of which might already be in your kitchen, but maybe you just don't know... Um, that they're there, what they do, or how you can use them. So, and hopefully you've learned more about these different herbs. Again, most of them are in your kitchen or you can get at the grocery store pretty easily. Um, and you can see that hopefully it's um, added different layers of knowledge about each of these herbs so they can find the one that best suits your situation. Um, and most of this information, I think almost all this information, um, is actually included in my book uh, that I wrote a few years ago. It's called Drink to Your Health, Medicinal Teas, Juices and Milks from Around the World. And that's available on Amazon if that's of interest. So thank you for your time and until next time, take care.